Dr. Joseph Medicine Crow's name now on this building. What does that mean to you? What does that mean to this school? I think it means that people see a name that represents the things they dream about. You know, these symbols of names and things that we see every day, when they really inspire, it really matters. And it's quite a contrast from the previous name. Rufus von um, Kleinschmidt was a president of USC. He also was a Nazi sympathizer, a eugenicist. He kicked out a bunch of Japanese American students during World War II. And his name has been a centerpiece of the university for decades. I think I told a story at the dedication that I learned about it because students were protesting at the building during my inauguration. So like any new president, I want to go, well, what are they protesting? And it was when I learned about it. And I learned about that whole history that you just described. I mean, I think he had his name there because he was a president. He also helped internationalize USC and, you know, brought it up in some really positive ways. But names mean more than just the good things you did, they represent all the things that you did. And people, I found out, have been saying for years that it really hurt to see his name there. And so why honor that on a building that sits as the cell, really right as the soul and the heart of the university? That's sort of part of this apologizing for USC's history decades ago, but then part of the challenge for you as well, you've got more modern incidents that you've had to sort of step in and in some ways apologize for USC's recent sins. Um, you come into office, you're dealing with the Tyndall scandal, you're dealing with the college admissions scandal. When you came in here, did you believe that USC had a culture problem? You know, I came in like I do with everything, seeing I'm a glass half full. I saw the incredible positives. I saw those issues. I didn't know all of them. I mean, Varsity Blues, I think, was announced the day they announced me, is when we first learned about it. But the way I see it is that if you have these sorts of problems, you do have to expose them. You have to talk about the history. You need to look for the legacy. But your most important job is making sure that you use it to learn and do positive things going forward. With these other issues, we had to solve those legacy issues and put in the guardrails, the professional management, the HR practices that really were not, they, if they were there, they were failing. Mm -hmm. So as a problem solver, that's the kind of stuff you think, okay, we can fix that. Do you think that this school was maybe too driven by money and that was part of the cultural problem? You know, I, I've thought a lot about that. I, I actually don't know that I think it was driven by money. I think it was driven by innovation and excellence, and you need to get the money to support it. And I think, if anything, people were working in a more siloed way. And innovators like, si you know, people like to work on their own and siloed. And I think professional administration shouldn't get in there to slow down the process, but you need to have the right guardrails. You know, there are still, we had an incident where some students complained about sexual assault on the Greek row and felt like they weren't being heard on that. What do you say to those students who are uncomfortable with what's happened there? You know, I think that's another, I think that's actually a perfect example. Now, st we haven't solved that problem, but what did we immediately do? We brought together people from all the houses. We brought in the, the sorority. We brought in faculty, students, and staff. They worked all through December to come up with a community agreed upon set of processes that would be necessary to improve safety and also allow students to come back. And some of the houses have not opened, and I don't know when they will until we could feel confident that they're following the rules. But again, I think it's about bringing people to be part of the process. Now, students are impatient. And when it comes to safety, who wants to wait mm -hmm. at all? But we're also trying to deal with things that have been here for years. So if it might take three weeks before you get moving on something, sometimes that's what happens. Not that you want to wait a moment for safety. And lastly, you know, you're USC's first female president. How are female leaders different? The sort of arc of my life was that I was always kind of the only one. When I went into the sciences, I was in a graduate group with 15 men and me. I go to the school, I, in all these roles. But my life doesn't feel like it's all about that, but my positions are there. So what I had to learn very early on, and I think it's the single most important thing, is that I couldn't try to imitate anyone else. I had to be me. And in a way, that's one of the most freeing things because you stop trying to imitate, you try to actually live your life in the way that you can do it. And I do think a lot of 
other women, a lot of other uh, leaders of color have that same experience and our difference becomes our greatest asset because we're not afraid of it. Mm. You know, we, we feel privileged to have that moment. And what we want to do is just make sure it's easier for everybody else that comes behind us.